Welcome back to Six Picks Music Club, a music podcast for people who really need to get their act together and write a will. All right. Well, hey, welcome back, listener. Thanks again. You've made it to another day. We are off to a great start of the month of April, and you guys get a shower? Anyone? Anyone get a shower for April? A shower? An April shower? You take a shower, right? What am I, Jake Gyllenhaal? Of course I take a shower, like every day. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was Ashton Kutcher who didn't take a shower. Uh, I think both of them. I think they just hang out and stink together. <laughs> just a bunch of musty dudes. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, so it's great to have you guys back. Good to see you, boys. How's uh, How's the world? It's good. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. pretty pretty good. <laughs> Golly. Well, anyway, so listener, I'm glad you're here because these guys definitely are. Welcome back to Six Picks Music Club, a music podcast where we create a playlist of six songs around a central theme and then talk about it. I'm your host, Dave, and with me are my two best guys, Jeff. Hey, baby. And Russ. <laughs> <laughs> This week on the pod, we're talking about songs that might be played at a funeral and songs that we would want and then songs that we do not want played at our funeral. Make it a little introspective, make it a little personal, but we can't do any of this with the clubhouse all locked up, though. We got to get a password. How are we getting in this week, guys? Is it Tom Scarrett cake? (laughs) (laughs) Let's give it a try. Oh, great. Yes, it is. Thank you, Tom Scarrett cake. That's got a double meaning because in Steel Magnolias, there's a funny part about cake involving Tom Skerritt. So you're welcome. 60-year-old women who are all happy that you're speaking to them. Those are my people. <laughs> Dude, old old ladies are my shit. When I was like always firmly embedded in the friend zone, the mom of the girl wanted the girl to date me more than the girl did. I feel like you get in good with the mom and that's money that's working while you sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, Jeff, I need to know more about this text that you sent. Uh, your son is a race car driver now. What's this about? Thank you for asking me to tell the story that I told you I was going to tell. It's like a fucking talk show. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> and we're all out of time. Moving on. <laughs> yeah. We'll see you next week for. <laughs> I take my oldest down to New Orleans for Mardi Gras. Okay, and my wife and my youngest stay back because she's super pregnant. And she was like, oh, maybe the youngest will like to have some time with just me. And you take oldest because he likes Mardi Gras and he loves the parades, et cetera, et cetera. He was born in New Orleans. Cool. And he also likes asking girls to take off their pants and watching them pee. This is a good spot for him. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to ask, is like a child at Mardi Gras, is that like taking a dog to the park? Like, do women just, (gasps) oh, my gosh. Look at him. And then they show you their boobs and you give them beats. That definitely does not happen. I don't know if you know about this, but basically phone cameras ruin that because apparently all men in the entire world can't just watch sexual liberation and not record it on their phones. Like just stop recording it and then people might be free with their sexuality in front of you instead of like gawking and taking a pick. Anyway... It's fun to take your five-year-old to uh, Paradesville and watch parades and the floats and all the wonderment and they're throwing stuff. It's the best. But what you don't think about is how to fill those days because the parades are at nighttime. So what are you going to do all damn day every day? So I was like, I got to find some activities. I got to fill some gaps here. So it's got to be something that's fun. I'll take him go-karting. Oh, hell yeah. Right? And I was like, there's this really cool motorsports facility that's like off the beaten path in the swamps outside of New Orleans. Me and you could go in and race go-karts that are 50 miles per hour, and then kids can race them that go 25 miles per hour. I did drive a race car when I was 15, 16, and 17 years old. Me and my dad built it. My grandfather was like a proper pre-modern race car driver when they didn't have seat belts and they wore like leather helmets with cardboard inside. Anyway, I called them at noon this day and I was like, guys, how old is a child supposed to be to ride in the two-seater with their dad? And they're like, well, we don't have any two-seaters running. And I was like, oh, 
Okay. And I was like, well, how about just driving it on their own? They said they have to be eight years old and 48 inches tall. And I was like, okay. I measured my son and he was 46 inches tall. And he doesn't have a driver's license, so nobody has any idea how old he is. So I just have to make him two inches taller, right? And then we're going to throw his five-year-old ass in one of these (laughs) go-karts that goes 25 (laughs) miles per hour. I did not tell my wife about this. Oh, my goodness. And obviously, the uh, people working at the racetrack have never actually seen a child, so they don't know what an eight-year-old looks like. Dude, I bet they're children themselves. They're probably a bunch of 17-year-olds who don't give a fuck. That's... Exactly right, Russ. You (laughs) nailed it. Before we went in, I put a top knot on on my kid's head to make him one inch taller up top, and then I stuffed his shoes full of paper towels. So (laughs) I I, I, I gave him like another inch down low and an inch on top. He's got the Ron DeSantis. Yeah, he's like Ron DeSantis boots. (laughs) That's exactly. I thought that very thing. So we walk in. And it's me and my buddy, Paul, and his kid, too. His kid is, like, older, and he looks older. We go in, and it, it's exactly like you said, Russ. There's, like, a 16-year-old girl working at it. Like, she could be the babysitter of my kids, right? But she has no idea how old kids are. I go, yeah, I got an 8-year-old here and a 9-year-old there. They're both 48 inches tall. Let's uh, rev up. Let's get this thing going. And she was like, mm, he looks a little shh short i would stood him up next to the roller coaster you have to be this tall thing and he was like yeah pegging right at the bottom and i was like he looks like he's 48 inches to me i mean that's what you said on the phone and she was like <laughs> that's true let me go get the engineer and then the guy comes out and he's like a young guy he's like oh yeah i'll put a booster seat in it i'm sure he can reach the pedals it'll be fine and i was like yes <laughs> and so i'm very curious i have no idea what's gonna happen we get him set up we put the helmet on him and go out there he's like barely able to press the pedals all the way down. He's far away and his arms are fully extended on the (laughs) steering wheel. And it looks like the helmet's big on his face and it looks like he can hardly see. And I was like, are you okay? And he was like, and he just did a thumbs up. And so I was like, you just follow me at first and until you get the hang of it. He goes, got it. So they put me in a cart in front of him so I could lead him. That cart didn't start. And so they are like, you go to the cart in the back. Now I'm behind kid. So my buddy takes off and he's kind of moving slow with his kid, you know, to be cautious. Yeah. And then my kid takes off and slams into that parked go-kart, just smashes into it, (laughs) smashes into my buddy's kid and his go-kart, pushes him out of the way, turns and guns it. And he's just picking up serious speed. He's gone. He's like burned rubber practically. I haven't even started. (laughs) I gun it and just hammering down to catch him because he's like cornering and he's taking the turns and, and going a little too fast, to be honest. And I finally catch him and then I jump in front of him and, and we are full on racing. The kid could just race. He just had it. So it's like in his blood and I couldn't believe it. I was like crying and racing because I was proud of him. I was thinking about racing with my dad, which I've talked about before on the pod. What my kid was not great at, he was great at going. He was not good at stopping. So he just slams into my buddy. <laughs> Boom! A huge wreck. And the car just kind of drifts off to the side, and he holds his arm, and he starts crying. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> and so I pulled up next to him. I was like, you can't get out of your car, but we'll wave the, the track guy down. He'll come over. We can pull off, and you're done. It's okay. And he was looking at his arm. I was like, I just broke this kid's arm. I'm going to get in so much shit. This is terrible. It was like 10 seconds later, he wiped the tears out of his eyes. He looked back at the track. And he mashed the gas and went right back at it. And I was like, <laughs> yes! Yes! First off, things are hereditary, right? And we do have the racing blood in us. See, I just have diabetes blood in me, I think, so. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. I think when we talk about what we're dealing with today... There is a little bit of an aspect to what we think a funeral should be. So these are songs that we would not want played at our funeral and songs that we would want played at our funeral for whatever reason. And I think it has to kind of start with like when you think about what that moment should be for your loved one or for yourself, like 
How do you define it? What do you envision there? I was thinking about the two sides of me, like the the best side of me and the worst side of me. And oh, okay, which one wins out in the end and which one people are thinking I am when I'm dead. Oh, that's interesting. And the constant battle of trying to be better. I like that interpretation. I did something slightly different, which is, I guess it took me a while, too, because I didn't send my picks until the last minute. Oh, big fucking surprise. But <laughs> <laughs> if you wait till the last minute, it only takes a minute. It has to be a good sounding song, and it has to have lyrics that embody what I deem to be a metaphor for the way that life works. A funeral, like a wedding, is a show. Right, right. And so if you're choosing your music for your funeral, what do you want people to hear that would relate to them about your life? And so that's what I was thinking. And then I was thinking, what would be that same metaphor, but like the worst song I could imagine playing at a funeral? (laughs) (laughs) I had a similar feel. I was an altar server growing up. And so like I worked at a lot of funerals with a lot of that. Very traditional kind of, I will raise you up on eagle's eagle's wings, wings. bear you on the breath of dawn. My goodness. It's a beautiful song. It's awesome. Make me to sign like the sun. No, I have that one uh, burned into my mind. And obviously, we're going to play it at my parents' funerals. God bless you, mom and dad. I'm glad you're both alive still, but that's I'm sure it's on your list. But I, I wanted something that was that was different. I don't want to think that my funeral is going to be this really somber, sad thing. I, I hope people are, you know, thinking about the memories and, and enjoying the time that we shared. So I wanted a song that was more representative of that. And then I wanted a song that was, you know, the opposite of that. And so that's kind of what I went with. Nice. But I think for today, let's get the nose out of the way first, and then we will circle back and do the things that we that we do want to, to be played. Does that sound good? Yep. Yeah. All right, killer. Russ, why don't you why don't you take the lead? So I'm dead. My friends and family didn't show up. The only people there are the ones celebrating my death and Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> he enjoys a good shit show. Anyway, they're playing Toxic Twin by Broken Love. That's B-R-K-N Broken off their self-titled 2020 debut album. Did you pick it just because like you couldn't imagine anybody actually listening to this at your funeral. <laughs> like, it was just been, with your foot outside. And there's something about like a leech sucking his face, I think. <laughs> like, oh, oh, it's time for us to leave. Right. <laughs> what is going on at this thing? Russ was really dark. And your and, and your brother's just over to the side, head banging. Yeah. The whole- a I love it. <laughs> I think my interpretation of what tonight was supposed to be is very different than what you guys did. <laughs> Devil's hand in the air. Yeah, but tell me, yeah, tell tell us about it. Like, what was the... Okay, so, uh, well, I'll, I'll get a little bit of the history of the band and then we'll get into it. So Broken Love is the brainchild of Toronto-born frontman and guitarist Justin Benlolo. So imagine the swagger of classic hard rock, the bite of punk, and a heavy serving of vulnerability melted mm. into one kick-ass rock band. And that's Broken Love. It's got to be authentic. Yeah, there it is. That's, you know, uh, it's my wheelhouse. What can I say? The Russ Goulash. (laughs) So delish. This album was recorded live to tape, which is cool. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, and it was produced by Joel Hamilton, who did the first two highly suspect albums, which is also cool for me. Love Joel Hamilton. Big, (laughs) big pro. Okay. All right. Now to the (laughs) nitty gritty, right? To me, this song is about speaking to that side of me that should stay locked up. The one that should never see the light of day. It's that part of me I try very hard to keep hidden. There's this anger that I've walked around with for several years now. It didn't always stay under wraps. You know, it comes and goes, but sometimes it's overwhelming and it makes its way to the surface. And I've definitely lost a few friends because of it. It's not always anger. Sometimes it's just like shitty behavior. Sometimes it's falling into a pit of despair and hoping to drag others in with me. And it's not toxic like Dave killing a gas station attendant. What gas station attendant did I kill? But it is definitely the worst version of me, right? (laughs) Oh, I see. Yes. Worst version of me would be just killing a gas station. I wouldn't be worse than that. That doesn't feel... I'm soft, right? So that would be the worst. (laughs) Dave's got a mangina. Dave's got things. Oh my God. (laughs) Keep it up. 
Don't get me wrong, though. Like in the moment, it feels it feels good to be shitty, right? But once I get my head right, it's all regret all the time after that because I'm just like, fuck, why did I even do that? And it's the small things that set it off. Sometimes it's like a it's a belittling comment that someone makes, or like what I just made to Dave. Let's see how he is next week. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do this thing that I'll pretend that I misheard something that someone says, and like, and so then I went to the store and it's like, wait, you want some more? More what? And then they're just like, <laughs> they don't laugh. And But I'm just, I've had enough whiskey that I think it's hilarious in my head. And they're just like, that's really annoying and stupid and you should stop. And I'm like, you want me to, what? I, <laughs> it's not a good thing. I've lost some friends for that too. That's my toxic twin. His name is Mavid. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes it's like a belittling comment. Sometimes it's just personal failure, if you will. Sometimes it's this feeling that I know I should ignore, but don't. The journey to the worst part of myself is not quite falling through a trap door, but it's more of a steep slope. And if I don't catch on to something quickly, then I'll ride it all the way to the bottom, which is how that goes. Yeah. I'm better these days, I think. In recent years, I'm better, but my toxic twin is very much alive and ready to pounce, I think, as soon as I forget to lock its cage. You have a whole Jekyll and Hyde situation, you think? No, I mean, I don't think it's a Jekyll and Hyde, but I can be shitty, and I try really hard not to be. Yeah. But when I was... Yeah, I say younger, I mean, even like in my 30s, like there have been moments when I just kind of free fall. Like I'm not happy with it. So I'm trying to be better. I could just see that if if something were, I don't know, there would be like a big life changing event for me that I could definitely go in that direction. And this could be the song that plays at my funeral, you know? Wow. So I hope, I hope not. I but. seriously doubt that, bro. Seriously doubt that. Yeah, I will... If I'm there, I will make sure we don't play this one. Yeah, instead funeral. we're gonna I play just, we're gonna play Coldplay. That's a <laughs> that's the song we're gonna choose for you. That's a an interesting song. I'd never heard that song before, and when I listened to it the first time, I definitely understood why you would not want that played at your funeral. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> like I know. not mine either, dude. You could just put that on my list too. That's double for me. <laughs> Dub double for me. I'm really like fascinated by the direction that you went in with it because I I don't have a toxic twin. I don't think, but I I do worry that people think I'm. I, I, my, I guess my biggest worry is that people think that I don't take them seriously and I never allow myself to be vulnerable with others. But that's I think I just sound sarcastic when I talk, but oftentimes I'm just being honest. <laughs> and, so, and so I kind of feel like maybe people just wouldn't show up to the funeral because he's like, ah, he had it all figured out and he doesn't give a shit about us. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, that was a that was a great job, bro. Great job. Like, yeah. No, seriously. <laughs> yeah. That's a, you got an A on that paper. You got an A I'm on the paper. Great job. I'm seriously complimenting you right now. I, this is the way I sound when I compliment. <laughs> I've always had this thing. Like I like my family thinks that I th I think that I'm better than them. They like they've they've. I hope they're. I I don't know if I would want them to hear that, but that's the true diagnosis. And I never have. That's what's so weird about it. Like, I don't understand where that comes from. You with all your book learning. Yeah, your books and you're going away and living somewhere else. And it's like, yeah, I just was trying to do a thing. Fuck. Like, what? You know, I don't think it matters. Have they seen Amelie? Have you shown them Amelie? <laughs> the film. <laughs> Yeah, or my or my mother in law named Amelie. <laughs> yeah, I've shown her. Hi, this is Amelie. She's a brown lady. Anyway, so let's uh, continue on. She's related to me now. What do you guys think about that? Let's just dig into the pork chops, guys. Don't worry about it. If you show them the movie, maybe their wonderment will be awakened, and they'll want to be a Europhile too. So maybe I should have watched Amelie with them. You know, it's not too late. It's not too late. Anyway. That was uh that that felt a little dark. So yeah, it's definitely a terrible funeral song. <laughs> you really nailed the assignment. <laughs> so the song that I did not want played at my funeral is one that we're gonna listen to next. It is a song by a band called The Smiths. It came out in 1986 off of their Queen is Dead record, their third album. The song is There is a Light That Never Goes Out. Oh, I thought you were going to play that song by Peaches, Sucking on My Titties. <laughs> 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 So I feel like last up we were talking about some, some songs that we thought like had a really good ending. Uh, that song does not. <laughs>
What is that called when you when you just sing the chorus like because he goes into there is a light that never goes out and then he just keeps repeating that shit until the end of the song rather than going through another verse. It's like in Karma Police, the Radiohead song, it just shifts and he goes, for a minute there, I lost myself. And then he just sings that over and over until the end of the song. Right. It's called like a terminal climax or something like that. It's a choice. I thought that's when you died after you jacked. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Good way to go, by the way. It's better than a double decker bus killing the both of us. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Couple things about this song. It's a, it's a fan favorite. Uh, fans of the Smith are like front runner for best Smith song of all time. There's a lot of S's in my pick today. Johnny Marr and Morrissey were, they'd been arguing and not getting along. And Johnny Marr actually left the band before their last record came out. Johnny Marr loved this song. There's an anecdote of him screaming like, oh, that was awesome. When they finished recording the song, when they recorded it for the first time, because he thought it was the best thing he'd ever written. Are you getting to why it's a bad funeral song? Yeah, I think there's a couple reasons. For me, again, like I want the funeral to be more of the celebration, which is the way that Morrissey sings this song. For me, it's like, it's just a wet blanket. He's the kid at the sleepover who peed in their sleeping bag. (laughs) He's also the kid that was like sitting in a tie in the corner while everybody's having fun. And he goes, this is not a good time. Like he was that guy who's like, could you put on a better record? Let's listen to. So he's Jeffro drinking coffee at the movies. (laughs) (laughs) That's a fair point. I also don't want people to kill themselves at my funeral. There's already me. I'm already dead. Like, no, don't end it for yourself. I think it celebrates death in a dark way. And I think that's the other thing that sets me off about it. It's kind of like celebrating this this freak accident thing that like ends the life of two people. And it's just, I don't know. I don't like to think about death like that. I know that that stuff happens. What's well, like wishing for it, though? He is definitely romanticizing. Oh, if I could just die while I'm by your side, that's a privilege of mine. And I don't take me home because I haven't got one. Oh, shit. He is just writing a song he doesn't like so that he can get laid. But he doesn't have sex. You know, he's a celibate. Oh, dang. First incel. He's not an involuntary celibate. He's a vol cell. He's a voluntary (laughs) celibate. Vol cell. (laughs) Because, honestly, Morrissey could have crushed ass universally for about five years. He could have had sex with everybody on the entire spectrum. Girls, guys. Yeah. You know, non-binary people. It was a very ACDC thing. Like, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, he could have fucked the whole world, and he supposedly did not, which is wild. He almost, like, thinks that sex is beneath him. Well, so, yeah, I think that's a good note for me to go out on. What do you got? For obvious reasons, thinking about dying a lot this last year, and also, like, sure. about to be a father of three, and I've never really thought of myself as having a brood, but then you're like, shit, dude, I'm going to die in, like, 30 years if I have a good run. How do I think about life? You start thinking about these questions, and you start going, am I going to make a will right now? I do think of life as a river, and I have long been drawn to the river metaphor. I have an alluvial spirit, I think, if I could say it that way. Machiavelli talks about life like a river, and you're going down the river, and it's got a terminal point. It's got an end, and you can enjoy the ride, but it's also treacherous. And so there's two parts of a river. There's the enjoyable floating down the river and the adventure of that. What a grand adventure. And you know that It will eventually deposit you somewhere. But at the same time, in some mighty rivers like the Mississippi are quite treacherous. You can't just float down them peacefully. You'll get sucked under and ground up, right? So there's a whole underbelly to the river, too. And all of this, it's about the relationship between fortune and finding yourself carried by the current of events in your life. What level of control can you exert over all that? I think that the river is about how we travel through time and how we travel through the journey of our life. And I've always been drawn to that, probably because I've always been near rivers. So I was like, I think I would want a river song at my funeral. And then I was like, what river song would not be great? For my funeral. What, what what river song would I not choose? And the song by PJ Harvey, The River off of 1998's Is This Desire is the one I would not play. This is a great song, but I think when you listen to it, you'll see why you would not want this played at your funeral.
Man, I totally get why you do not want that song played at your funeral. It is just like, it is way too sexy of a song to play at a funeral. Like, I'm not going to lie. I just went from six to midnight, dude. Like, everyone is going to be having sex at that funeral. Like, just slowly looking to each other and then just like <laughs> making out real, just okay. passionately. And then it's like the slow just, are eye we contact gonna mug? movie sex they're having. So let me Ugh. be clear. This song rules and it does totally fuck i mean this song fucks so hard i absolutely love pj harvey over the chorus that sludgy bass line and the trumpet oh man so good but why not at the funeral a river of semen this is a semen song thanks dave that you got it oh he really likes it he's with you okay we know that sarcastic jeff is <laughs> genuine jeff <laughs> I know subtext isn't your thing, like, so I'm trying to help you out. <laughs> yeah, so, oh, is this about, okay. So, PJ Harvey and I share an appreciation for bodies of water. They recur in all of our I think music. you have an appreciation for bodies in water, isn't it? The bodies in water? <laughs> this is true. Um, I'm not fucking around, but it's about the darkness beneath. And I'm not a man of darkness. I'm a positive guy. And so I I want to stay on the top of the river. I want the adventure, right? And so that's what I want people to remember about me, not all of the horrors of the world, right? Which I do study. I study them for a living. And it's like I delve into that dark world and I want to make it better so other people can have the adventure of life too. And so that's the way I want to remember, not for all the darkness. But this song is about a Flannery O'Connor short story called The River, and it was written in 1953. It's the most depressing story. It's Southern Gothic, so it has to be depressing. It's basically like this boy who's overlooked by his parents. His babysitter takes him to an evangelist revival, and he gets baptized in a river. And then he meets this guy named Mr. Paradise who ridicules the evangelist, and he's got cancer. And so he constantly shows up and makes fun of the evangelist for not actually saving people and not curing his cancer. And then the boy thinks that he's important because he's been baptized. And so then he goes into the water on his own to relive the baptism or to experience it again and get closer to Jesus. And he drowns. He gets swept away and drowns. Yep. He gets swept away and dies. And is that not the most depressing shit? Man, I really thought semen. God, <laughs> I was way off. So that's about as dark as you can get. And you know, that's not the good river. That's the bad river. That's the river that took Jeff Buckley from us. Oh, shout out to Jeff. My goodness. Yeah. So again, I think it's a really sexy song, but I understand where you're coming from, that it's also a pretty dark song about a child dying. Probably not one that I would want at my funeral either. Let's get out of the river. No, we're going to stay in the river, but we're going to stay in the river of our life that carries us from one place to the end. Man, guys, I'm going to tell you what. This song, I've always felt so emotional to this song, and I think that's part of the reason I chose it, but it is Find the River by R.E.M., Man, I am, like, jealous that you picked an R.E.M. song before me. Dude, this song is so damn pretty. The first time I heard the song, I was like, this is one of my favorite songs. I just immediately loved it. I'm a melody guy. We've talked about this. Only later do I really explore the lyrics. And then when I explored the lyrics, I was like, this is unbelievable. I could never write a poem as good as these lyrics. You know, and trust Dude. me, I have tried, sir. This is a person that's at the end of their life addressing a younger person or maybe even addressing a younger version of himself. He's saying, hey, now, little speedy head, the read on the speed meter says you have to go to the task in the city. You know, you're busy. He's gone through his life and he's reflecting back on it all, right? And the river's taking him and emptying into the tide. But listen to just the last stanza. It's strength and courage overrides the privileged and weary eyes. So he's, he's stealing himself to die. It's the privileged and weary eyes of river poet search naivete. So he's saying, like, I'm here pondering life and my trip down the river and trying to be poetic but now I'm just stealing myself for death. And then his last note to the person that he's addressing, the young person is pick up here and chase the ride. The river empties to the tide. All of this is coming your way. 
You'll be here one day, just like I, I'm here right now, emptying out into the ocean. Oh, yeah. God. It's good. This is a good funeral song. Oh, dude. No, I love that song. I love that song. I can't wait to hear your songs, your good ones. Not the, the ones that you want. Is <laughs> that what I meant? 14 episodes in, I can't wait to hear a good song by you guys. All right, let's go. <laughs> I'm going next. So, yeah, the song that I've got, I think it really embraces kind of what I talked about earlier with what I hope that my life has amounted to and the people at the end are, are kind of celebrating this journey that we went on. When people are sitting there or whatever and it comes on, they're like, oh yeah, this is definitely a song that Dave would have picked. My song is Talking Heads, This Must Be The Place, Naive Melody. Okay, I just want to say that thinking about this song in regard to your funeral I feel like there's an open casket, there's a keg, we're all wearing Hawaiian shirts and white pants, <laughs> and just like drinking beer, like doing a little bit of a shuffle, all hanging yeah. around the keg and the dead body at the same time, but it's like, it's just fun. I think I'm also going to try to sing in somebody's mouth at this day, because I, like, I don't really know what it means, but... I'm going to have the mortician like leave my mouth open. <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry, guys, everybody, but I got to sing into his mouth right now it's a requirement he he told us back in the day i think this song is a really sweet song this is uh the closing track off their fifth record called speaking in tongues they released that in november of 1983 and this was like a rare optimistic song for the talking heads they typically weren't so optimistic but a little history on it david byrne was in a relationship and he was gonna write a love song nice this was his first attempt to write a love song which is stupid but he wanted to do it without using like the typical love cliches. It's just like he was like, ah, you know, let's see how else I can can write about love. And I think that singing into your mouth is that thing. It's like I want to be so close to you. We're face to face. There's a line in it that I think maybe one of the most beautiful things that you could say to your partner is that you've got a face with a view. And it's just like this thing that I could stare at and see how epic it is and just get lost in it. When I think about my most optimistic version of the end is that I've got this great family and they all still love me. I haven't chased them off with my bad opinions about rock and roll or whatever. And they're there and they all feel like we did the right thing. We did a good job. I don't know. I want to do a good job. I feel like being a family dude, being a partner and a parent, like that's one of the things that I've done pretty good in in my life, and and I, I want to do a good job with it. I want that to be the end. And I feel like this song kind of represents that in a lot of ways. There's like a musical texture to it that is one of the driving factors, why it's such an earworm of a song, why it pulls you in, and it's this thing called an ostinato. It's a series of repeating patterns, essentially. So the song opens with that bass line, and then Jerry Harrison's got the guitar up at the top that's just like giving it some depth and counterpointing the bass line, and it's just like a really good hook. And I feel like the song is a relationship. It's these people that are committed to each other, and they're going through this life, and it's repetitive, and you're going through these things and doing these things, and it's like years and years and years. But every year, there's like a new little texture that comes in, either with like a marimba or a different drum snare or like a different little guitar riff or something like that. And it's all of these little points in your life that like come up. I feel like that's the song, right? It's like... Oh, interesting. Yeah. It's not just that like we got here. It's that you got to the end but like it's that we had all these other things along the way and it's just you know i think it's i think it's a beautiful song that's cool am i wrong in thinking that david byrne and tina waymouth swapped and he he played the keyboard and she played the guitar on this song you're probably not wrong i think that's where the, the naive melody comes into play because they both were relative amateurs and so they had to play it very simple i really like the line it's like did i find you or did or you find me there was a time before we were born right wow there's a lot packed into that. Well, and I feel like it's a whole life, too, because at the beginning of the song is like, you know, you pick me up and turn me around. I feel like that's a little baby that's crawling away and like they pick you up and move, you know? Yeah, that's a baby. And then at the end, it's like, I love me till my heart stops. Love me till I die, till I'm dead. You know, hit me on the head. It's done. This is a sweet song. And I could see it being like a fun little groovy party that we're having with all of your yeah. art and beer friends from around Texas and the globe. You know, I want it to be a life well lived. You know, I want people to smile. I want you guys to look around at each other and just like also be friends. You know, I want my friends to be friends with each other. So that's my play it pick. It's a good one. Yeah, it's fun. I like it. Thanks, man. Russ, bring us home to the afterlife. So I'm dead again. And this time my friends and family are there. 
There's Dave. Hey, look, Jeff's there too. Good on you, Jeff. Thanks for coming both times. Oh, yeah, I showed up. What's up? I didn't prepare at all, but I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> all right. The song that I want played at my funeral, which is so weird because you guys are, went such a different direction on how you actually picked your songs as you're like, I wouldn't physically play this song at your funeral. I went a different way. So fuck it. You don't actually want to play your song at your funeral? I think it would be great, but I just think it would be a hilarious song to play at a funeral. I say. So the song that I would want played at my funeral is called Something Worthwhile by Pretty Vicious off their 2019 debut album, Beauty of Youth. Pretty Vicious was a Welsh band that formed in 2014 when they were all teenagers. They were between 15 and 17, the, the whole band. They released their single Cave Song on SoundCloud, hoping that it might give them enough cred to start playing small gigs, but instead it took off. And before they knew it, they were in a record label bidding war. Oh, wow. So in January of 2015, they signed with Virgin EMI Records. Nice. They had six songs at the time, which they did not tell the label. <laughs> so it turns out the label had their own idea of what they wanted the band to sound like, and the band had a different idea. So they tried out several producers, burned tons of money, and it just wasn't working. So finally, the label hires Owen Morris, who produced Oasis, Definitely Maybe, and What's the Story, Morning Glory. Solid. Except he and the band clashed big time mm. and then the band was unhappy and the label wasn't happy huh. the label wanted them to sound like an indie pop band and pretty vicious didn't want that so they ended up just parting ways and so their record deal was gone they ended up getting a new manager and found producer dan austin who helped them harness their sound and they started just releasing singles don't forget these guys are just kids so in 2018 they became the first uk band to sign with big machine group who at the time was taylor swift's label you got this group of kids who ended up signing with two major record labels before they were 20. They recorded Beauty of Youth, then Virgin EMI, their first label, ended up partnering up with Big Machine Group to help release the album in UK. <laughs> oh, we want some of that. Can we get back in on that? <laughs> Frontman Brad Griffiths felt the pressure of trying to produce the first album uh, more than his other band members and started spiraling out of control and drinking heavy and had mental health issues. And so they released the album in July of 2019. And in October of that same year, they broke up because of his mental health issues ah. or citing health issues at least. And that is the end of Pretty Vicious. What? They aren't doing anything. They're done. Dang. It's a crazy ride to the top and then imploding. Anyway, so that's just kind of a crazy story about that band. Icarus. My goodness, yeah. Bringing it back to our theme, Something Worthwhile is a song about not conforming to societal norms to find happiness. I'm a stay-at-home dad. Like, who works? So when we were pregnant with my daughter, my wife and I discussed what made the most sense and the job I was working could be done at home. So I thought, okay, I'll do it. Right. And uh, so I yeah. took the fatherhood plunge face first. And for several years, the only time I could work was early in the morning or late at night, which has now defined my early to rise schedule that I still live by. You know, I'm up at four <laughs> in the morning every day just to get to work. Just grinding, dude. Anyway, so my wife's maternity leave was over after three months because we don't live in Canada. You're just not trying hard enough. It's true. So um, I'm stuck with an infant and the fuck do I know about being a primary <laughs> caretaker? So she's still breathing. So I, I didn't totally fail. It's okay. She's still alive. But there's a stigma of being the dad who brought kids to the park, who brought them to community library events. Uh, uh, toddler music class. Yeah. Drop them off and pick them up from their little preschool half day things that they went to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like school parties. It's one thing if you're the dad who shows up every once in a while to like help out or oh, I'm picking up the kid today. But when you're the dad every day, holy shit, I have acquired a lifetime of looks. Wow. Looks that made me feel like an outcast. Ah. And 90% of the moms shun me. So then I'm just standing there by myself watching my daughter play and feeling like everyone thought I was a pedophile at the party which is fucking uncomfortable. It is hard to be the pedophile at a party when you didn't bring a kid. <laughs> yeah. Nah, that's tough, dude. That must be like a Southern thing. Because here, not to be douchey about Canada, but I'm always hanging out with my kids with the moms. There's one uh, WhatsApp group that's all single moms and me, who's like very married. <laughs> <laughs> and it's totally fine. Like, they don't care, you know? Even this year, my son, his first grade class, they're getting a group moms together. And we're like, oh, can 
I'd be part of this. And they're like, mm, mm-mm. <laughs> so they put my wife on there, but I was not allowed on it. Oh, uh, man. You should try growing out a real shitty mustache and try how that works. And wear crotchless pants. <laughs> it's been like, man, that's not how I ever saw this going. Like, this has been one of those times. And you're like, why, why is this a good funeral song? Okay, where are you going with this? <laughs> In the end, <laughs> we'll always cherish the extra time that most dads don't get to spend with their kids, right? Dude, totally. Yeah, I've changed a bunch of diapers, but I was there for all the first words, all the first steps. I get to hear all the stories fresh off the press. And, you know, now that they're playing sports, I get to go to all the practices, which is fun. So now I've graduated to a soccer mom, but they still don't hang out with me. Man, that sucks. That's just been my experience with it. All right. Anyway, to to reel it back in. So Something Worthwhile is a song about defying expectations, like ignoring the haters and naysayers and living your life to your fullest potential without the outside noise getting in. I can stay focused. I can move on. Like, I'm not going to let it get me down. You should maybe let it get you down, though. Like, if we're being honest about it. (laughs) (laughs) No, we want to keep the toxic twin out. Come on. All right. It's also a song about not dwelling in the past and keeping your head straight and moving forward. Like, always forward. This is something I teach my kids. Yes, the past happened. Yes, we can learn from it, but we can't change it. So we move forward with our new information and we try to do better the next time. And this is also a song about working hard. The line is, you beat yourself to death just to be here. And working hard is very important to me. And not just working hard at my job, but working hard at life, working hard at taking care of myself, which is my new journey these days. And also working hard on my relationships, which have, you know, taken a toll over the years. So I'm trying to be better about staying in touch and being, I don't know, more sensitive and not shitty all the time or something. I don't know. (laughs) How is this the, I thought this one was going to be the uplifting one. And the other one was about this. No, it's me being better than this. Oh, okay. okay. All right. And so this is also a song about youthful rebellion, which I love. I mean, uh, like I love the youthful idealism of love and not war, life over money. These things are great to me. I see them in my kids, right? Right, yeah. I'm not denying money isn't useful. I'm not saying I don't have any. I'm just saying that, you know, if Gen Z is listening, keep going. <laughs> you got yeah. this, right? Our world could use an influx of youthful idealism turned policy. This song is just about being the best version of yourself, which is what I want to be. To wrap it up, the three core values we teach our kids are to be kind, to be helpful, and to be hardworking. And I think for me, if you accomplish these things on a daily basis, you will have a life that's worthwhile. And that's something I'd love to be remembered for. Hell yeah, dude. That's nice. You guys actually have a list of values. I should get some of those. I don't have any of those. Holy shit, dude. It changed our life with my younger son. My younger son, my young son, my son, whatever. Um, it. <laughs> <laughs> he was, What's that? Yeah, so I have a tick. He was tough and he went terrible three and stayed terrible three. And then, uh. man, at one point we wrote down these three things and said, this is what we need to do. Like we need to be helpful. We need to be kind. And we need to be hardworking. And I don't know what happened, but it just clicked and he shifted and he's been just a joy since weird anytime we start backtracking we just kind of remind him of the things we do and he used to be like a really selfish kid but he's super kind and he's thoughtful now and it's just weird how it changed everything so So he just needed like a mantra yeah that's it or even just like an anchor to like say are we being kind are we being helpful are we being hardworking? like if we can frame our decisions or our mistakes or whatever like in that context i think that's that's brilliant that's good man that's good i like it yeah i i like that too russ i like that song a lot i we haven't talked about the song that much but the the guitar riffing like three quarters through is very cool very good shit. You were starting to say something before I interrupted you, because that's been my theme tonight, is interrupting. But uh, what did you hear Like when you heard it? You said, I heard something. Oh, yeah. I'm sure he'll be able to get that thought back from fucking 25 <laughs> minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Dave. Well, never mind. <laughs> No, I think that's great, man. Like, there's something worthwhile. Even even the uh, the lyric is, I think, really powerful. And, and how it starts, where it's like, don't let them under your skin. Don't let them win. Like, you've sacrificed too much. I feel like we do that for our families. And you run that line of, of appreciation and all the things that aren't seen, all the things you do that nobody notices or whatever. Like, there there's a lot of thankless moments in being in a family or having a family. And yeah. that's just part of it. That's precisely the reason I'm going to leave mine. <laughs> 
Well, I think both of those picks are great, both you guys. I appreciate that I feel like I know a little bit more about you guys, you know, for different weird ways. Oh, yeah. I, so I totally was like, ah, this one I'm going to try to go a little more personal. I rarely do that. As I was going through, I'm like, this is a very convoluted way to, like, get this across. So actually, a lot of the stuff just will follow the song <laughs> lyrically, <laughs> but I didn't really reference the song at all. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Which is awesome. I liked it. It's, it's good, man. It's good to talk about who you are so we can shit all over it. <laughs> we can't really, like, hurt you if we don't know who you are. Sorry, this happened while the song was playing, but I saw, like, a Twitter photo of somebody that was announcing their engagement. And and if you zoom in on the bracelet that she was wearing, it was one of those little, like, letter bracelets, and she said, just come slut on her bracelet <laughs> while she was like holding her ring out <laughs> that's the best she wears that that's amazing yeah i uh, married the wrong people <laughs> <laughs> this episode of six picks music club was produced by betty drillser <laughs> <laughs> i bet he drills her <laughs> <So dumb. laughs> Edited by Willie Lair. And special thanks as always to Dixie Rex. Dixie Rex.